weapons forged by the Allied armies in World War II, none have played a more vital part than the fighter planes. And of these, the Spitfire has by far the longest and most eventful history. The Spitfire, so dainty in appearance, so deadly in action. RCAF airmen flying in Spitfire wings have written a proud page for Canada in the winning of this greatest war. They have chalked up fine records in many theaters of operation. Men with flying in their blood, like Buzz Berling of Malta, Dal Russell and Keith Hodson in Britain and Normandy, Wendell Buck McNair, one of many Canadian aces, and the late Lloyd Chadburn, who once said of his men, they do the good jobs and I get the decorations. Three Spitfire wings of the RCAF flew with 2nd Tactical Air Force in Europe. To each wing were three squadrons. To each squadron in the air, a dozen aircraft, plus all the pilots and ground crew and equipment their job required. These Spitfire squadrons were only one part of Tactical Air Force. Many Canadians were flying in other aircraft with RAF or Canadian wings. But the Spitfires played an essential part in a swift-moving, deadly, striking air force. Tactical airfields, as distinct from permanent fields, have two striking features, their mobility and their sameness, no matter how far they travel. This layout in England in the first days of TAF in 1943 looks much the same as it did later on in Normandy and Holland. The same ak ak batteries manned by airfield defense troops of the RAF. The outdoor maintenance section where the mobile crane worked a double shift, chiefly on engine changes. The metal tracked runways unrolled in strips by the ground crews and pegged fast. On all the tactical airfields, we see the same outdoor machine shops on wheels and the engineering officer's tent always close by. Yes, everything on a tactical airfield folds up into a truck. You can't even get away from the dentist. In the green fields and orchards of Kent and Sussex, airmen ate their meals out of doors. Mess tins, cups, and cutlery were all part of their issue kit. In summer of 1943, the Canadian Spitfire wings committed for service on the continent lived under canvas, on airfields where everything was mobile, from machines to shower baths. Here, while flying fighter sweeps and giving protective cover to formations of medium bombers, United States marauders, the wings were as non-static as possible, adapting themselves to rough and ready conditions. When the weather chilled, they sawed wood for their fires to keep fit as well as warm. They hauled logs from the woods nearby. Sawing and chopping were competitive, and the losers bought the drinks. The 
long time lags between missions were filled in different ways. Eating was always popular, and the search for eggs was unending. There were letters home to write. But many just lounged around playing with the squadron pup, or sitting in on a little honest poker, looking up now and then to watch the fortresses thundering overhead towards the continent. These men, gathering in the briefing tent, soon would take off on a bomber protecting mission. They listened intently as Wing Commander Dal Russell gave them information and instructions. By 1943, the days of scrambling fighter pilots to battle with daylight raiders had gone. The Allies by now had won the advantage in the air in quality and quantity of aircraft. Now the job was to protect bombers or fly sweeps over France searching out the Luftwaffe. From briefing, the men moved off to their dispersal quarters for parachutes and flying kit. Then on to a short, last-minute briefing by their own squadron commanders. Here, Jeep Neal gave a pep talk, put his men in a good frame of mind before they get going. And then out to the waiting Spitfires, where the ground crews had everything set. The groundsmen helped the pilots into the narrow cockpits, strapped them in and made sure that nothing could break loose and stun a flyer during the frenzied twisting and turning of a dogfight. These early Mark V Spitfires were employed mostly for bomber protection, sometimes for two-man sorties of train busting. But on fighter sweeps, the more powerful and maneuverable Mark IX Spitfire was used. the Spitfire wings operated, their missions were directed from a main operations room close to London, which kept in constant touch with the squadrons. While over enemy territory, the Spits were in direct contact with operations by radio telephone. Radar equipment in this control room plotted enemy aircraft and broadcast their positions. If one of our flyers got lost, he called to operations. Our radar plotted his location and radioed a bearing home. All missions, whether sweeps or escort jobs, were planned with infinite care. Normally, some pilots remained at the station on readiness for emergencies. English weather permitting, they could pass the time playing volleyball. Roughly 90 minutes after takeoff, the aircraft were down again from their missions. Ground crews herded them into their own dispersal bays scattered all over the field. The Spitfire pilots were usually a weary-looking bunch of men on their return, especially after a tiresome routine mission. 
But if they had met and knocked down any Huns, they were as happy as a bunch of school kids. Ground crews lost no time in checking aircraft, finding out from pilots if anything had gone wrong. Pilot and ground crew were always a team, each deeply concerned with the way the aircraft performed on duty. Everyone wanted to know what had happened on the mission, the intelligence officer in particular. Anyone lucky enough to destroy a Jerry was plagued with questions, and battles would be reviewed many times over back in dispersals or in the mess over mugs of tea. the ammunition, rearm, refuel, hurry it up. On the hard, reliable work of the ground crews depended the effectiveness of TAF operations. These unsung heroes were always on call, working long and irregular hours. Refueling was often done by hand with tins and funnels, for gas bowsers were as scarce on the mobile airfield. A spitfire with cowlings off looked like a bird picked clean in a few seconds after the crews had begun their between flight inspection. There were 101 things to check. Engine leads, plugs, instruments, control cables, tires, hydraulics, guns. If the guns had been fired, new canvas patches went over the muzzles to keep out dust and debris. Fed and doctored, the Spitfire was soon ready for a run-up test, with one groundman in the cockpit, one manning the battery cart, and others sitting on the tail to weight it down and keep the Spit from nosing over. again were serviceable, and up they went on the second mission of the day. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the Mediterranean, Canadians of the Desert Air Force had been on the move for many months. 417 Squadron, the city of Windsor, became the RCAF's most traveled outfit rolling across North Africa, Malta, Sicily, and finally into Italy, always in close contact with the British and Canadian ground forces. In these southern campaigns, squadrons learned the principles of tactical air warfare that were later developed to the full in Normandy. On every new move, the first job was to put up tents on space allotted by the advance party. Next on the priority list were slit trenches. These men of the Desert Air Force, always close to the front, were the first TAF crews to dig in against enemy air attacks and need the protection. Within a few hours, the airfield was working normally from its new setup. Operations had never ceased for part of the intelligence section had come forward to brief and interrogate pilots who had taken off on missions from airfields in the rear. into two camps. In the servicing echelons, they looked after minor repairs, rearming, and refueling. Armorers in the desert and in Italy had a rough time of it because of dust. Their guns and cannon had more stoppages than under normal conditions. 
and they worked continually with new methods to minimize the grit. Ground crews on maintenance handled major airframe and engine repairs and engine changes. Dust kept the engine fitter experimenting too, trying to devise better and better filters for oil and fuel. Yes, he's Canadian, hat by courtesy of the Italian Navy. Everything was out of doors, rough and ready. An open field was the instrument shop for delicate repair work. The shell of a wrecked Jerry fighter plane was bedroom and washroom for an LAC. Blankets had to be aired and shaken against vermin, a constant threat in these southern locations. But there were consolations as well. Plenty of grapes and no fancy prices to pay. And when the Italian sun was bright, life could be cheerful and relaxing. The city of Windsor Squadron had an exacting job to do, that of low-level attacks in direct support of the Army. Led at this time by squadron leader Bert Hool, they were the first to carry the 500-pound bomb, slamming it onto targets designated by the Army, and then blasting enemy transport and troops with machine guns and cannon. Though the atmosphere at most briefings was casual, almost carefree, the missions themselves were different. German flak was accurate, and casualties were high. But from this experience in Italy and the desert, valuable lessons in tactical flying were carried over to the Western Front. Meanwhile, training for the Normandy invasion was getting steadily more intensive. There was rugged motorcycle training for airfield personnel. There was firefighting drill and the use of fomite to smother grass fires on the airfields or burning aircraft. There was waterproofing and testing for all vehicles, and personnel were trained to drive over steep ramps and through water. Every squadron had its own peep, which had to take the water test along with the trucks. Thousands of Allied airmen swear solemnly that training for their invasion was far more rigorous than the real thing. In May came Exercise Fabius, immediate preface to the great Normandy story a land, sea, and air scheme in which the three services mocked a full-scale invasion. This south coast scene was a crystal ball preview of the spectacle soon to follow. Ships, tanks, aircraft, and men. Now, with their training complete, the Spitfire wings were inspected by high-ranking RAF and RCAF officers. General Eisenhower, Supreme Commander, paid a visit to find for himself whether Canadian spitmen were ready for the tremendous role they were to play in support of the invading armies. All the squadrons now flew the Mark IX Spitfire, and Group Captain Bill McBrien gave the Commander-in-Chief a full account of its special features. Pilots swarmed from all over the drone to hear General Eisenhower's message when he spoke to them in front of their mess shortly before the historic 6th of June. Music 
And finally, the word to move. In breaking down an airfield, one of the biggest headaches was the canvas maintenance hangar. But the men liked to have it along, for besides housing aircraft under repair, it doubled as a theater for movies and traveling concert parties. And on Sundays, it was their chapel. No one in air or ground crews was left out of the packing chores. Each man saw his own baggage loaded, and each saw that the tent he shared with two or three others was packed in a place where he could find it again. A tent that didn't leak needed careful watching. In a few hours, the whole airfield was packed and ready with drivers standing by. Even the pups went along. They were in this thing up to their necks, too. The Spitfire wings were ready to roll, compact, mobile, and glad to be on the move. The airfields traveled not as an entire unit, but in separate convoys. Dispatch riders led off each group out into the winding English highways, joining the streams of transport heading towards the south coast. Marshalling areas in southern England, the airfields waited for the next step towards the continent, a step for which the whole world waited with them. D-Day, June 6, 1944. Spitfires flew overhead one part of the immense protective cover for this greatest invasion force the world had seen. So complete is the Allied air cover, not one German plane tries to break up the landings. Defense is left to the ground forces and to the minefields. beach parties and advance airfield detachments stream ashore in good order. Onto the French sand for British and Canadian troops. Trucks heavy with supplies roll out with the tanks, all marked with the identifying Allied White Star. The 21st Army Group and 2nd TAF, already working in close cooperation, shared the same ships and funneled inland through the same traffic routes. Montgomery knew the worth of tactical air force from his desert campaigns. Now he would call still more for close air support in the battles to come. This was the small strip of France gained by Canadians and British in the first few days of fighting. Within it would soon be crammed four airfields, three of them for the Spitfires. Combined operations troops of the RAF ran a shuttle service to and from the beaches, hauling gas in jerry cans for the planes that soon would come dropping down. Air Force surveyors went to work immediately, while British Army engineers drove graders and fashioned runways. 
Much good Normandy grain fell in the process, but not without a reason. Soon you could see the long stretches of runway taking shape within a mile of the beaches, in sight of the massed shipping lying offshore. Onto this first new field, ready on D plus four, Air Vice Marshal Broadhurst, head of the TAF group in which Canadians flew, led in the first flight. Wing Commander Hugh Godefroy of Toronto was with him, and so was Larry Robillard of Ottawa. based on Normandy had now begun. Taking off in clouds of dust, the Spitfires with their new black and white Allied markings looked like angry wasps. Dust was a tremendous handicap. Pilots wore their goggles on the ground as well as in the air. The flying control staff often found it difficult to see each other, let alone their aircraft. During these first great days in Normandy, Pilots saw little of the enemy in the air, but they did see much of the land fighting from their cockpits, and there was plenty to talk about while waiting for refueling. In a few days, the rear airfield parties arrived in Dakotas. Now the Spitfire wings were ready to work entirely from the continent. Squadrons still based on England made so many visits that a transient mess was established. That is to say, more tables and benches were set up. The Chow Line soon included Canadian nursing sisters Pitt Kethley and Mulholland, first women to land with the British or Canadian forces. Those without tables just sprawled on the turf, picnic fashion. The old water wheels on Normandy farms were characteristic of this part of the country. And so were the German cavalry horses liberated by our advance. Air Marshal Bredner, then Chief of RCAF Overseas, paid a visit to the Normandy airfields. He made a thorough survey of conditions under which the Canadians lived, worked, and fought. And he, too, found the going pretty hot. In July, newspapers and radio were crammed with stories of invasion and news of what the fighter pilots were doing in the skies over Normandy. The Luftwaffe finally had begun to fight in earnest and Spitmen rarely flew a fruitless mission. Harry Dowding of Sarnia had just destroyed two Huns. Still full of excitement, he described how his victims blew up in midair. Groundmen quickly swarmed over the aircraft while the pilots moved off to interrogation, where intelligence officers would sort out and establish their claims. These were days of high excitement, when every arm of the great invasion force was hitting the enemy hard and gaining ground. But each night, the airfields and the ships lying offshore were fiercely strapped and bombed by enemy night fighters. The nightly flak barrage was a constant feature of those first weeks, when sea and land operations were so closely linked. Before the closing of the Falaise Gap in August, Navy, TAF, and 21st Army Group worked within such close range that pilots on their days off could travel in a few minutes to Army or Naval units and watch them in action. Here, aboard HMS Rodney, Wally McLeod and Dean Dover were less than three miles from their own airfield.
never again in the European war were the three armed services fighting in combination so closely crammed together. In the ancient towns of Normandy and Flanders, the airmen played a part in liberation ceremonies and mingled with the townsfolk. At first, the Norman peasants were reticent, but once assured the Hun would not return, their reserve melted. French Canadians were thoroughly at home here in their native tongue. Rapid moves after the Falaise breakthrough late in August brought the airfields up into Belgium. The forward elements of one Spitfire wing entered Brussels one day after the Germans left. And here the airmen watched a rich ceremony of thanksgiving, ending four long years of the Nazi regime. Convoys rolled night and day as Taft strained to keep up with the army's swift sweep across France, deep into Belgium and Holland. Life began on each new airfield when the first trucks rolled in, herded along by mobile service policemen. Heaving baggage and equipment in and out of the trucks was an old story by now, and the men had worked up a smart pace. With a long winter looming, Tents were left folded and personnel were billeted in nearby villages or in huts on the drone. The briefing and interrogation pen was about the only canvas to be raised. Weather was often wet, cold and foggy, but given a hole in the sky, the Spitfires were in action. The days brightened with the coming of early spring. Skating on the Dutch ponds was a taste of home. Soon the ground was drying and hardening on the airfields, and preparations began for the final phase of the air war against Germany. Along with the change in flying conditions from England and the desert, the role of the Spitfires themselves had changed to fit each new phase of the war. Pilots now were briefed mainly to dive bomb rail crossings, bridges, and marshalling yards. Success of this vast rail cutting program was the key to destroying the German armies, for on it depended the crippling of all German transport in the Ruhr. Flyers were ordered on their return trips to shoot up trains and road convoys. They did all they were told and more. New Mark 9 and 14 Spitfires, representing the fullest development of the Spitfire's special talent, were now in service, deadly weapons for tactical air warfare.
Soon the war had moved beyond the Ruhr, leaving in its path signs of the ruthless efficiency of bomber and fighter operations. Wrecked locomotives were numbered in hundreds within a couple of weeks, the work of heavy bombs plus cannon fire by the fighters. Little transport escaped. Here was one reason why the German armies cracked. Men and supplies just couldn't move with all this going on. But Spitfire pilots were not only bombing and strafing all this time, they still pounced on enemy aircraft and ran up an amazing number of kills. One wing destroyed 54 Huns in two consecutive days. The fields were a continual swirl of aircraft going out and coming back from battle. Many new fighter aces were born during these days of winter and early spring. Everyone's effort was paying off, and that's all that mattered to groundmen or pilots. Living and working conditions were bleak, but as long as the men got action, they were happy. Within 20 miles of the Dutch airfields, German cities lay smashed under skies filled with the vapor trails of heavy bombers heading deeper into the Reich. Little but ruin was left for the visiting airmen to see. Life went on in these crushed cities, but their shape and form had been battered into rubble. To Cologne Cathedral came airmen like Don Gordon of Vancouver, climbing to the gallery and looking out across the Rhine at the husk of the city. Serving in North Africa, Italy and France, they had seen destruction before, but nothing like this at the gateway to Germany's inner fortress. Across the Rhine, the long-awaited move over the pontoon bridges deep into central Germany had come at last. The Spitfire airfields were mobile again. The trucks rolled at a fast clip, for this was the big advance, and everyone wanted to be on hand for the finishing blow. For the airmen, this procession through the smoking cities was a promise that the end was near. Soon their convoys, marked with the maple leaf rondelles, would reach their final positions inside Germany, the end of a ten-month journey from England. They would not have to move forward again. With the German nation close on defeat, the need for the fighting plane's devastating work soon dwindled. For the pilots, the heavy pressure of operations lasting all through the spring was now relaxed. It was the end of the mobile airfields. Each one of them had remained something of a little village within itself for more than a year. War had taught these flyers to destroy with skill and precision. But when both feet trod the ground again, they had not changed. They were the same men who had left schools and jobs to join the fight. Even the ground crews now had time on their hands and could take it easy with the pilots talking over the past eventful month. All these men
men had taken a full part in the great Allied operation against Germany. All of them had seen and shared the fury of the air war. They had lost good friends killed in the fight. When they came home, it would be with an added wisdom that training, travel, and responsibility had taught them. With this record of experience behind them, their own people could welcome them back with proud confidence for the future.